Everyone good? All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Donna Shillington, and um, welcome to the last day of the Marine Seismic Symposium and to the final uh, special interest group, which is going to be on marine seismic needs for uh, SC4D. But I just wanted to start by thanking um, the people who have been principally organizing this, and that's uh, Casey and uh, Kristen and others that uh, Iris have done a fabulous job with this meeting and, and helping us uh, get ready for this session. So many thanks. Many thanks to them. All right, so our, uh, our goal for this session is really to take advantage of, um, of this symposium and this gathering of all these marine seismologists to get your feedback on marine seismic needs for SC4D. So to that, um, to that end, uh, our plan for today is first to do some short um, introductions to SC4D and some of the science needs for marine seismology. Um, so I'll, I'll start by doing that. Um, we'll kind of describe to you in more detail um, the kind of draft plan that we've been developing for marine seismic needs. And, um, and so this, and this is the main thing that we want to get your, uh, your feedback and input and ideas on. And, um, and then we're very lucky to have Dr. Araki here with us, who will be, who'll tell us about some of the lessons learned from um, the, the donut array off of, um, off of Japan. And so hopefully these presentations, that'll be about um, 30 minutes, and then we want to dedicate the rest of our um, time block together to discussion. And so we'll have some plenary discussion uh, following the talks, and then we'll break into um, to breakout groups to get feedback on, um, on and have smaller group uh, discussions. It's kind of our, our plan for plan for today. So um, first, some introductory remarks. Um, if you have seen this before, you can go and get yourself a cup of coffee and a, and a bagel, but I wanted to make sure we were all, all on board with, with what this is. So um, SC4D is a, a research coordination network that is focused on the science behind subduction zone hazards. So earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, and, uh, and landslides. And um, there's, a, there's an office in the University of Washington that's led by uh, Harold uh, Tobin, and, um, and then a series of, um, of working groups that are kind of focused on, on different aspects of that overall kind of umbrella um, mission. And so the working groups have been kind of working on defining uh, scientific questions and um, uh, with feedback from the community and plans for how to address those science questions. There have been a series of workshops, webinars, town halls, and so hopefully um, this isn't the first time that, that you're hearing about this, uh, about this effort. But our goal is at the end that we would have um, a, a scientific plan to actually tackle some of the science questions behind, behind these hazards. And so if you want to know more about kind of the about SC4D, I encourage you to um, check out the website. And so um, why <laughs> subduction zones? These are a place where we have some of the largest hazards that are all taking place in kind of one place. The, the largest earthquakes and tsunamis, very active um, volcanic systems, and tremendous surface processes that are causing landslides. And so this is a place that we need to study for um, societal reasons, the hazards that these things cause, but also gives us an, an opportunity, a window into some of the most fundamental earth processes that, that we'd like to understand. And so there's sort of three um, working groups that are uh, have been working on tackling or defining um, plans for different parts of that uh, of the subduction zone. There's the faulting and earthquakes working group who've been um, focused on um, earth, the processes behind earthquakes and tsunamis. There's the magmatic drivers of eruption working group um, focused on magmatic systems, many uh, active volcanoes, and the um, landscapes and seascapes working group who've been focused on um, surface processes ac across these systems and and their um, and including landslides, the most dramatic manifestation of those. And, um, and very recently, a very important and exciting um, working group has just been uh, uh, stood up, the Building Equity and Capacity Within Geosciences. This group is being led by, um, oh, I, I didn't really see had all these animations on here. This group is being uh, led by uh, Mike Prudensky, and they've just formed about a month ago, but they're um, kind of and so they're still sort of defining what the um, particular focus they want to have within this, this broader space that would really um, maximize um, the links and opportunities that hopefully would come from a, um, a future SC4D. Um, and so I, I encourage you to reach out to, to check out their website and reach out to uh, Mike Brudinski to, to um, learn more about this very important part of SC4D. All right, so, um, so I kind of described these sort of three uh, scientific um, categories within SC4D. And, um, and, the, and the part of SC4D that's really been 
kind of talking the most about marine seismology and sees it as like the most, as a, as a very critical part of the plan is the faulting and earthquake cycles working group. So I'll kind of dive in and tell you a little bit more about the scientific questions for, for this part that we've been discussing so far. And then we'll get into um, what marine seismology is and we think might be needed to, to tackle those. But first, um, just to tell you who these people are here, the, um, all the lovely members of the Faulting and Earthquakes um, Working Group. And so um, please, uh, many of those people are on this call today, but uh, please also feel free always to, um, to reach out to any of these people as you have other ideas or feedback for us um, in the future from this presentation or, or future presentations. All right, so the science questions. Our umbrella question for, for this part of SC4D is when and where do large damaging earthquakes happen in subduction zones? And kind of under that broader umbrella, we've defined um, four um, kind of sub questions. Um, the first is what controls the speed and mode of slip in space and time? Um, the observation of all these amazing ways that um, subduction zone uh, fault systems slip and behave kind of get, can give us a offers the opportunity for a fresh window into controls on slip behavior, including in, in great earthquakes. Um, the second question uh, concerns precursory behavior. There have been a number of recent studies that have given us kind of tantalizing um, evidence for different types of precursory behavior, but the um, existence of and style of that behavior seems to be quite variable, so we still have a lot to, to learn on that front. Um, the third question is about um, uh, what would promote um, a, a tsunami during a, an earthquake. And again, a number of different ideas are out there for uh, what would make a particular place particularly tsunamogenic. And so that's our, our third question. And, and finally, the fourth question concerns other fault systems. Um, the megathrust is not the only um, hazardous fault within a subduction zone, and um, nor is it the, the only thing that's doing um, account accommodating deformation. And so to kind of have a complete picture of the hazards and a complete um, uh, handle on the full deformation that's happening, we need to study other faults that are in both the overriding and, uh, and downgoing plates. So that's the, uh, that's the fourth question there. And so these questions have really, we've been get, trying to get feedback on them from the community and they've also sort of been born from a variety of previous um, community uh, documents. And so the, the kind of work of the um, working group has been to try to develop a strategy to actually tackle those questions. And, and hopefully you've had a chance to see some of our other uh, recent presentations on this, but you know, the first thing we have to define is, you know, what do we actually need to do to tackle these questions? Observations, uh, models, um, experimental work. And uh, to that end, we've developed a, um, a traceability matrix to kind of really lay out what we need to know for each of these questions and what kinds of things we would need to do to provide that information. And you can look at that traceability matrix is posted on our, um, on our website. So I encourage you to check it out and, um, and give us feedback though. I won't um, yeah, torture you on a Friday morning by taking you through it in detail right now. And so from that traceability matrix has come kind of plans for generic experiments. And that's what we're really gonna um, sort of share with you uh, later in this presentation. Um, another important thing that our community has to decide is, is where we wanna um, do the observational part of this. And so to kind of inform that discussion, we've been uh, defining the attributes of subduction zones that we think are most, would make them most favorable to tackling our questions and developing an inventory of subduction zones to help deform, uh, inform our, uh, not deform, inform our uh, decision-making. And so that inventory also is posted on our website. So please um, take a look tell us if we've gotten something wrong or, or missed something out. And of course we need your feedback on all of these things. So um, yeah, please um, continue to engage with us and, uh, and, and give us feedback as we go forward. All right, and so, but kind of from those activities, we can kind of define two major categories of, of, uh, of things that we feel like are required to tackle our question. You know, first, if we wanna, understand you know why subduction zones behave how they do we first need to know how they're behaving and so a kind of key um, category that we've discussed is making new amphibious observations of subduction zone behavior so this is from things like um, amphibious geodetic and uh, and seismic arrays and with a particular gap currently being um, what's happening on the on the offshore part of uh, part of these systems but to have the, the kind of deeper time of how subduction zones are behaving, a, an array of um, paleo seismology and geology would be, would be required to, um, yeah, to take, give us a bigger picture of time for how, what's happening. 
And then the, the second category is that, you know, once, as we know how they're behaving, we want to know why they're behaving how they are. And so that's going to require um, a broad and very integrated set of geological, geophysical, experimental, and numerical studies to, um, to, to understand. And, um, and this can in includes kind of relevant to today, geophysical imaging of subduction zone configuration and, uh, and properties that um, to provide a context for um, seismic behavior. And so to kind of meaningfully address our question, questions, we really need to capture a, a pretty large scale of um, subduction zone processes. And so we kind of, and this, that's what's uh, being illustrated on this cartoon. We think that we need to span something like a 500 by 500 kilometer area to really you know, fully capture um, the um, down the uh, extent from you know, outboard of the trench to fully down dip through the um, volcanic arc and in a long strike stretch that could encompass, you know, large locked patches, for example. And so the colors here are sort of um, visualizing large um, coupled uh, regions and also possibly areas of uh, slow slip being shown in, uh, shown in red. And so we need to be able to observe behavior across and structure across, um, across this scale length in order to, um, to really examine our questions. And so that's been an important guide on then what, we, what we'd actually like to do. And so maybe this is a somewhat shocking transition, um, but um, so we really, to, we ultimately aspire to a really ambitious effort in order to observe across that scale, uh, all of the processes that we think and structure that we think we need to see to tackle our questions. And so these cartoons are sort of showing sort of a cartoonized version of notional um, components of a, of a large, or components of a large notional experiment. So a, lar a large onshore offshore um, geodetic network with particularly dense instrumentation near the trench where the um, mega thrust shallows and kind of the, the spacing of this has been guided by some um, kind of resolution tests that Andrew Newman, one of the members of our group has been doing. For, for, the, um, for the seismology side, it would involve a, again, a kind of onshore offshore array to observe subduction zone behavior. So we'll talk more about that shortly. And then an, an array on the right hand side of uh, geophysical imaging to image the subduction zone structure at different scales. And kind of paired with that geophysical observing, we also think that we would require a pretty grand um, geological observational effort, both um, of samples from, um, from modern subduction zones, but also from, um, from analog sites to provide us a window into detailed structure of um, fault systems that we can't um, we can't access at the at the surface today, and kind of paired with these observational efforts are would we imagine highly um, integrated numerical modeling and experimental work. And so, you know, the the cartoons I showed you are kind of an ultimate grand aspiration, but what we have been discussing is something that would be phased, where we would have an earlier phase that would involve the analysis of um, existing and synthesis of existing um, data sets development of technologies um, that might be needed for a future SC4D and, um, and other kind of planning and, and, and partnership building. And then a second phase that would involve um, acquisition of more backbone sparser data sets um, and then leading to uh, the, the kind of more grand cartoons that, that I just showed you. And, and, a, and a key part of this is a, a, a very close um, integration again of um, planning for and undertaking of these um, observational efforts with um, experiments and numerical mo modeling, which can help both guide the design and help us understand the results of what we, we see from those observational um, efforts. All right, so that's kind of the background. And so now um, myself and Jeff McGuire are gonna tell you a little bit more detail about the particularly the, the seismology parts and the marine seismology parts, because we'd like to get your feedback on you know, what we've been discussing so far, have we, have we captured everything? Are we prioritizing the, the, the right things? And so we want that to be the subject of some of our uh, discussions going forward. So I will briefly give you, um, tell you a little bit more about the geophysical um, imaging piece of this, um, which, which you can see here. And so um, and now a lot of text, but kind of the, the core components of this would be um, a kind of backbone, backbone imaging of the subduction zone using um, broadband seismic and, um, and also magnetotelluric data. And that's kind of being um, shown with some of these, uh, with the diamonds across this area. And so that would give us a, you know, an imaging of the 
the large scale architecture of the, of the subduction zone. And then, but additionally for kind of backbone imaging, um, deep penetration of seismic reflection data, seismic um, refraction data, and denser deployments of um, broadband OBS for imaging along a series of, um, of transects across the subduction zone. And this would delineate the megathrust geometry and, um, and properties and give us more detailed imaging of the, of the structures of the overriding and subducting plates, including the, the fault systems that would be there. Um, we uh, multi-beam bathymetry is another kind of core component of our um, of our uh, of our discussions. We would we feel we would need that across the, the entire system, as well as um, higher resolution seismic reflection lines, maybe more closely spaced out near the trench. And and these data would give us a window into active faulting, particularly um, out near the um, the toe. And in the case of a larger earthquake, could be provide the chance to do a repeat survey to to better constrain. Um, some, some of what those behaviors were. And um, so those are kind of all things we feel like it would be required near the, you know, the beginning or in the earlier phases, I guess, of an SC4D. But then, um, you know, other later imaging targets would be really guided by what we observed from, um, you know, seismology and, um, and geodesy. And so the kind of orange box is showing that, you know, as we understand in more detail how the subduction zone is behaving, that will guide what we, <laughs> Um, areas where we might need to do with denser and higher resolution imaging. So including things like 3D seismic reflection data and controlled source uh, EM and a very dense, um, you know, OBS for active and passive imaging within an area of interest. So that could be across a shallow slow slip zone or boundaries between locked and um, slow slip behavior. Uh, but again, it would be sort of in a later phase and guided by um, guided by how the subduction zone is actually behaving. And then, um, and then finally, another important piece that's kind of illustrated by these red boxes would be um, heat flow data to, um, to constrain, um, yeah, of course, the temperature structure of, of the subduction zone. So those are kind of the pieces and I've kind of put in parentheses here, how they link to some of the different um, scientific questions that I described to you before. And so for many of these pieces, we feel like it, broadly, we have a lot of the technology to currently do these or something something like it. Um, so we would require um, you know broadband seismic and MT instrumentation, of course, um, Langseth like capabilities for acquiring both deep penetration 2D and uh, 3D seismic uh, reflection data, controlled source EM instrumentation, and multi-beam uh, bathymetric mapping capabilities. Perhaps the the one component here that um, that we don't really that would require some. Uh, new uh, development would be nodal OBS for deploying a, a really, you know, dense OBS networks across an area of interest for, um, for high resolution imaging. So that's maybe one place that we would, would need to go. But for, and depending on what subductions that we pick, um, some sets of these uh, observations may already exist that we could, that we could leverage. But, um, but then, I'm, but guided by what is there and how the subjection zone is behaving, other we would need to fill in others as needed. So that's the kind of the um, imaging piece. And now I will turn it over to um, Jeff McGuire to talk about the kind of earthquake seismology. Great, well, I don't know if I can pack that much information in as quickly, but uh, um, so yeah, so the middle box that's highlighted and I think is on the next slide too, is um, the sort of long-term monitoring instrumentation. And if you look at the legend below, you can see there's at least, I don't know, eight or nine different types of, um, well, sensors and or geometry of sensors that have been um, discussed by the Faulting and Earthquakes group. And again, they're all tied to the science questions in the beginning, and we're going to kind of go through them a little bit in detail. Um, but again, the real key is of this uh, breakout today is to really get feedback on um, the offshore ones. So I don't want to totally ignore the onshore, even though it's a marine um, seismology workshop. Um, you can see there's a number of different things onshore um, from a broadband background array, which is the red diamonds. I don't have a pointer, but, um, you know, just, you know, designed to do sort of obvious things like uh, allowing people to study the faults in the overriding plate um, and the downgoing slab. But a lot of this is also designed to help improve our understanding of what's offshore in the lock zone, um, in particular inspired by uh, Japanese studies with uh, HiNet. You can see some boreholes there in yellow um, that would be used to 
study both uh, the down dip ETS zones, but also the offshore um, low frequency earthquakes and things like that. There are a number of arrays along the coast that are intended to improve offshore earthquake locations during the time periods when OBSs aren't necessarily available. Um, there are some strong motion instruments there to help understand a large earthquake rupture if it happens. Um, and what else is onshore? Um, oh, there's a bunch of short periods seismometers to uh, densify along crustal faults if they are deemed to be interesting in the particular subduction zones that SC4D goes after. Um, and I think next slide, and we'll switch to the offshore. So <clears throat> again, offshore, there are a number of um, components. The, the orange diamonds are kind of the main monitoring network. And the, we're going to talk a lot about those today. The idea is that they are really designed to go after this um, sort of key missing ingredient in subduction zone studies, which is kind of the ability to do global comparisons simultaneously of co-seismic slip in large earthquakes, micro seismicity before and after the big earthquakes and slow slip events. And so they're not just a, a broadband OBS, which is what it says in the caption, but they're a broadband OBS, uh, absolute pressure gauges for slow slip and strong motion for um, moderate and large earthquakes to be able to study things like the energy budget of slip is, or of rupture as it approaches the trench. And so you can see there's any number of objectives, very low frequency earthquakes, slow slip events, up dip tremor, intra-slab seismicity, all of which are tied back to the science questions. Um, and one of the really key things that the working group is focused on right now is trying to define exactly what the requirements are for that um, network. And so we're going to talk a lot about that in the next couple slides and in the breakout groups today. Uh, there's a few other types of offshore instrumentation. I'm not even sure it's on here, but you saw it on Donna's previous slide. There's likely to be short period OBSs to densify in various places at various times as targets are identified. Uh, there is a cable out there that is designed, that is meant to indicate offshore um, fiber optic distributed acoustic sensing. Not you know, most cables just go straight. Um, and that one is very uh, conveniently curved to come back on shore around our um, locked and unlocked patches, but um, you can always hope. And I think, you know, we'll see a little bit of that um, later today from Maraki-san and uh, Zhang Wen's talk in the afternoon. And it's obviously a really rapidly advancing aspect of seismology and hopefully offshore seismology in particular. Um, and again, that'll sort of be dependent on what opportunities are available wherever the C4D goes, but um, it's definitely part of the equation to consider how much emphasis we should be placing on trying to make that happen. And then the last thing I wanted to focus on was offshore shallow boreholes out by the trench. You can see that um, a lot of things are, there's a lot more instrumentation near the trench. The network is specifically designed to get denser as the fault gets shallower, um, both for the sort of broadband strong motion and APG OBSs, but also um, shallow boreholes that are, well, designed to record fluid pressure transients and up dip slow slip and possibly up dip tremor depending on what's in them. Um, <clears throat> and again, one of the key questions is question three, understanding how tsunamis are generated and the slip budget on slay, splay faults versus the mega thrust and um, essentially how the, the energy budget of the rupture is partitioned as it comes up dip. And all of that um, feeds into the, the denser instrumentation in the shallowest part. And then question four, the uh, other types of faults in the subduction system, you can see there's instruments into the outer rise um, in particular to capture those faults, which I'm not even sure is somewhere on here. All right. So next slide, um, I'm going to throw it to Emily to talk about current proposal plans. Okay, so Jeff got you all the way to the end of the game in a way, which is, you know, this fairly grandiose ambition. And I think we could all agree that it would be awesome if every dot on that map existed, right? Um, let's come all the way back to where we are now, which is phase zero, which is the preparatory phase of SC4D. Um, phase zero, the preparation has to include uh, thinking about 
what technologies are really critical to making this all work and simply don't exist at the moment. This, um, where are the technical gaps? And one technical gap that we've identified is long-term deployable OBS systems. Something that can sit on the seafloor for five plus years and uh, without moving, with low noise, and but have intermittent data retrieval. Obviously, you don't want to put a box on the bottom of the seafloor for five years and don't know whether or not it's even working. That, that would be bad. Um, and so uh, in phase zero of SC4D, we need to identify these technical gaps and sort of come up with a plan to solve them so that when we get to the end of the game and we start actually putting instruments in the ground, we, the right instruments actually exist. Okay, to that end, um, SC4D has in fact successfully submitted the first SC4D proposal. I should rephrase that. It is a SC4D proposal, not the SC4D proposal. Um, so there was a mid-scale research initiative, uh, one call, call this, um, that has recently happened this winter, MSRI is how it's normally referred to. And so we submitted a pre-proposal um, on behalf of the community to, uh, with, to develop instrumentation and infrastructure um, in a design phase mode that will eventually solve these technical gaps so that we can move on towards a uh, more full instrumentation vision as, as outlined in phase two. And so this MSRI pre-proposal included a component from the Faulting and Earthquake Group, which was specifically this, a five-year deployable interrogation uh, five-year deployable OBS system. It also included a component for the MAGMA group, MAGMA interruptions group, which was um, a uh, multi-parameter, uh, multi-sensor system to uh, that would be deployable on volcanic systems. It concluded, included a component for the landscape seascapes group, which is um, an ultra high resolution seafloor bathymetry effort. And it included um, something that is useful to all three groups, which is a DAS component. Okay, that pre-proposal we got informed last Friday, one week ago today, is in fact moving forward to the full proposal stage. So um, that full proposal will be due uh, April 23rd. So um, now would be a really good time to give us some feedback. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to outline the scientific functionality of this um, technical development, again, design phase proposal of the uh, long-term deployable OBS system. And we are very, very interested in your feedback. Are we, you know, we're not at the point of getting to the correct engineering solutions. That is the point of the design phase. Should we be so fortunate as to get the funds, we will have time to work out the correct engineering solutions. That's why we're going to get those funds if, if that happens. But are we at least specking to what you guys actually want um, in terms of a long-term deployable OBS system? And so um, I'll walk through what we've got and then please spend some time in the breakout groups telling us whether we got this right. Now would be the time to say you got this totally wrong. That's not what we want. Please say that if, if that is the case. Um, so, um, so the scientific functionality as um, it appears to be to uh, the working group is that we uh, need something that is long-term deployable because there are a number of scientific functionalities, things uh, tracking micro seismicity in the subduction zone, tracking more exotic sources in the subduction zone. There's a big emphasis uh, if you're interested in the earthquake cycle and how things evolve over time, ambient noise, how structure evolves over time. And all of that requires that you have a low noise instrument that's not moving around. Um, and so um, a five-year deployable instrument that would include broadband, would include absolute pressure gauges, and it would include strong motion. Um, should we happen to get a large earthquake, we would be really remiss if the strong motion was not included. Um, it would uh, the package is designed to should 
should be designed, will be designed to have better coupling and increased ground motion fidelity, which most likely means burial. Um, and, um, and so that is a fairly expensive capability. And so again, feedback, please. Um, it is to be designed to be have regular uploads of one hertz data um, and some hybrid data through a data mule solution, such as a wave glider, um, an engineering solution to that might be an acoustic modem. And as well as, and this is extremely important, occasional upload loads of all high rate data through an optical modem as um, depicted here in this drawing. The idea being that, you know, you could send out a fairly ordinary uh, vessel to uh, pick up the, all the data on a uh, regular basis and you're not waiting for or after an event. So you're not waiting five years to um, get your data back. Um, and that um, would also be capable of clock synchronization via that means. And of course, we would like um, a long-term power capability. Um, no point sticking it for five years down there without power. Um, and so that may turn, that could be wet mate cables um, to ROV out the uh, power packs, or it could actually be a five-year long power pack. Again, the engineering solution is what the design phase is designed to solve. Um, John, I should also add that uh, this uh, subcontract to this is going uh, through um, OPSIC and um, the uh, John Collins is here and um, available to discuss the technical challenges. Um, so um, I will pass it back to Jeff here and just repeat the prompt for the breakout groups and the discussion is, is this the correct functionality? Are there things here that are expensive and you don't really care about? That would be lovely to know about. Um, and then also are there things that are missing here that are really critical for doing the science? All right, thanks, Jeff. Back to you. Great. So next slide. This is a much more wordy version of the last slide, but um, again, the key thing is that we are really trying to get feedback in the breakout groups today about exactly what should go or what the goals and should go are of these backbone instruments, these orange diamonds um, that are going to cover the lock zone offshore. And again, you know, there's any number of technical solutions. You know, we really need to understand, and there's trade-offs between all of them, and you know, and cost is always the <laughs> the thing to worry about in the end. Um, and so, I think we really need to understand community priorities. Um, all of the things that are on this list of potential capabilities, with a little bit more specificity, um, are things that would allow us to make progress on the science questions that were in the beginning of the talk. Um, some of them may be absolutely required and some of them may be more in the luxury category. And that's kind of what we're trying to get more information on today. You know, John and Andrew in the OBSIC facility have, um, well, have their hands full over the next couple of weeks trying to turn this um, general idea into a very specific proposal um, of things that are going to be developed and tested um, as part of the MSRI process. And so again, really um, speak up in the breakout groups about what you find most valuable and most highest priority for um, the capability of this kind of long-term five plus year or longer monitoring network offshore. Um, and with that, I think next slide, we're back to the agenda, if I remember. Perfect. Um, obviously much of the offshore earthquake component of SC4D is uh, deeply and highly inspired by the successes in Japan over the last 20 years, led by Jamstack and other groups. Um, we're all continuously in awe and jealous simultaneously of everything that happens offshore in Japan. Um, and uh, Araki-san has agreed to stay up in the middle of the night and give us uh, an overview of some of the lessons learned from Donut, um, which I'm personally really looking forward to. And take it away, Araki-san. For those that don't know him, I should say that he uh, he has been leading uh, the Gemstack. Yes, go ahead. Yep. Can you can you uh, see this 
right? Yes. Okay. Yes, looks great. Uh, uh, I will talk about the lessons learned from DoNet experience. Uh, uh, this talk is based on the collaborative work with uh, people shown in here, uh, inside Jamstack and outside Jamstack. So the DoNet is a, a network uh, for the seismological monitoring and tsunami monitoring offshore Japan. Uh, basic parameter uh, shown like here, uh, basically the 50 or more uh, observatories uh, spread out uh, in uh, this area. And uh, the characteristic of the network is uh, replaceability. Uh, so each uh, science uh, observatory is uh, replaceable by ROV uh, for maintenance and upgrading. And each uh, safer sensors uh, basically, the uh, earthquake and tsunami monitoring, so strong motion and broadband seismometers, and uh, APG and uh, hydrophone and uh, differential pressure gauge and thermometer for safer temperature monitoring. So, to accommodate the needs for the broadband seismic monitoring in the safer, uh, we developed a unique installation technique uh, outlined here. Uh, so, this is the, the all the uh, seismic sensors in DUNET is uh, in buried, completely buried in the seafloor. So this is performed by the insulation in the caisson penetrating into the uh, sediment in the seafloor. Uh, we developed a, a piston core modif modified for this purpose and uh, uh, each, in each uh, observatory, we penetrate the caisson of this lens. And then uh, here is a video, and uh, we send the ROV to the CIFRA and uh, empty the uh, penetrated caisson by suction pump, like here. And uh, lower the uh, seismic package, here is the DUNET seismic package, into the caisson to install. And then the safer pressure gauges are located within 10 meters, but uh, on the safer. This is a pack, uh, pressure package and uh, installed in the safer. Then the to uh, secure the seismic package in the case, and we use the uh, sand to backfill inside the caisson to uh, make a good coupling between the seismic package and the uh, surrounding uh, sediment. Uh, this covers the whole uh, installation technique in the safer sensor in DUNET. And we also try to uh, link uh, deep safer borehole observatories uh, drilled by IODP program uh, we currently have uh, three borehole stations linked to DUNET and running uh, continuously. Uh, in these deep borehole observatories, uh, seismometers are lowered near the bottom hole. Uh, for example, just in this case, uh, like uh, about one kilometer deep borehole uh, by uh, tubing. And then the cement is injected through the tubing to fill around the seismometers, about 100 meter section is cemented. And then the section below the cemented uh, part is used for poor fluid pressure monitoring, which is very sensitive for the uh, throw slip event. We have also tried this kind of uh, extensive uh, installation technique. And uh, here is the, uh, so ASCEC, uh, this, uh, Nankai Trough region is uh, uh, highly coupled and uh, not uh, so many earthquakes occurring in this plate boundary uh, so far, except for the one uh, occurred in 2016, uh, magnitude uh, 6.0 uh, in this location. So here is the record of CIFRA strong motion record from DUNET. Uh, nearby the epicenter, 
uh, showing the four stations around the uh, epicenter uh, for horizontal components and vertical. Uh, scale is different for horizontal uh, and vertical, but uh, the maximum horizontal motion is about uh, one uh, G, uh, and uh, but for vertical about 0.1 G uh, in these stations. And when we look at the uh, vertical uh, record, we see that some spiky vertical motion, and for horizontally uh, the motion, uh, it, we, we can also recognize the skewed uh, waveform. So we have uh, some have the question on the quality of the data set. So we also uh, compare the event uh, between the borehole and the seafloor. This is uh, the 20, within 20 kilometer from the epicenter. Uh, comparing between the borehole and the safer stations. So borehole uh, stations has uh, not significant uh, acceleration, about uh, 0.2 uh, meter per second square. And, but the uh, horizontal motion in the safe floor is uh, ex exceeding four uh, meter per second square. So significant amplification of horizontal uh, a component record in soft sediment seafloor is uh, observed. So the shallow seafloor sediment has a significant uh, weak link between the sensor package and the uh, uh, sensor package and the sediment. So we should be uh, uh, warned about this uh, feature. Uh, we have another uh, uh, important uh, uh, aspect of the amplification in the horizontal component due to the uh, regional uh, basin structure uh, often found in the uh, subduction zone. This is a, a study by Nakamura-san uh, in 2015 uh, comparing the earthquake record in land and Seafloor uh, uh, dunet stations. So, in shallow, uh, short period uh, record, uh, the, these uh, two types of insulation, uh, peak uh, ground velocity, matches very well. But for when we look at the long period uh, seismic wave, seafloor uh, stations has much amplification. Uh, this is due to the uh, ocean basin uh, structure. Uh, amplifying the long period uh, lady wave. And uh, this is uh, uh, the a result of simulation uh, based on the basin structure modeled in the uh, seismic uh, analysis. And it's much well, very well to the observation. So the, we should also care about the uh, local structure uh, like in the sediment. Okay. So, but and uh, as you find in the CIFRA record of the M6 earthquake, uh, we noticed uh, some spiky signal, which uh, it, I, we suspected uh, uh, coupling between the sensor and the sediment is not uh, as uh, very well. So we uh, conducted the joint research with Railway Technical Research Institute. Uh, they are very much uh, uh, interested in the uh, fidelity of the uh, record from the CIFRA. So we simulated the uh, sensor installation uh, packing uh, in this uh, setup. Uh, to observe the behavior of parking sand around the seismometer package by uh, this packaging on the shake, shake table. Uh, this is a chamber filled with sand and water to simulate the caisson to house the uh, pre, uh, seismometer. And seismometer package is buried in the uh, sand, uh, water filled sand chamber. Uh, so and the sand motion 
uh, is can be observed through the window. And, and uh, this is the shake table. Uh, we apply the 1G acceleration uh, at five hertz to simulate the uh, uh, ground motion in the seafloor. So, and the uh, acceleration was recorded in the seismogram package to compare with that of shake table. And the result is the packing sand started to flow, uh, we found around 0.9 G. And uh, that resulted in the reduced response in the uh, seafloor, but the response has recovered soon. And the reorganization of sand distribution due to the flow uh, improved the tolerance to higher acceleration. And we compared this with the cylinder package on the sand surface and uh, found that uh, much better performance uh, with the buried sensor. Uh, so on the cylinder on the uh, seafloor has a rolling, many much rolling and uh, sinkage of the package resulting in a no reliable record when compared with the reference on the shake table. So the, we, to, to some extent, the uh, sand packing is uh, holding the acceleration, high acceleration, but uh, we have uh, some kind of limitation. So we continue to uh, improve our installation technique using a much more expensive platform, but uh, effective for the uh, securing the uh, coupling between the sensor and the sediment. Yeah, here's an example. Uh, we established this uh, in very recent uh, days. Uh, we uh, installed the chiltometer using a seafloor drill and the cementing, uh, use cementing for higher performance seafloor observation. So we aimed to obtain suitable environment for seafloor chilt observation. So we developed a new insulation technique as shown here using seed rail and also spotting cement at the bottom hole and wire line sensor uh, to lower the instrument to the bottom of the borehole by ROB. So we conducted a series of operations uh, in January and the successfully connected that uh, deployed instrument in the, uh, to the DUNET in February. And uh, now uh, the instrument run, running continuously. In this setup, we drilled a 90 meter uh, borehole uh, uh, from the seafloor. And uh, we uh, filled the uh, uh, cement at the bottom and the uh, instrument uh, developed with uh, Mark Zumbag uh, is lowered at the bottom hole. And uh, also we uh, feel the uh, sand to secure, better uh, secure the instrument into the borehole. So the other result, uh, we obtained a very quiet horizontal component seismic record in low frequency range shown here. Uh, in this record, uh, the op newly de uh, deployed the optical titometer is shown in these traces, uh, exhibiting a clear uh, horizontal record of teleseismic uh, earthquake occurred offshore New Zealand in this day. And uh, in comparison with the nearby seafloor uh, uh, buried uh, broadband seismometer from DUNET, also shows uh, some uh, horizontal telesystemic record, but uh, uh, hidden by the seafloor uh, noise. So this shows the suggesting a significant in improvement of coupling of the sensor to the sediment. And I believe the seafloor strong motion measurement should benefit also from such an installation technique. So, and also, uh, this may be uh, off the topic, but uh, we recently uh, very much uh, interested in the using uh, fiber strength sensing for uh, earthquake monitoring. This is the example uh, uh, recently uh, published uh, from EPS uh, by Ide-san and others. Uh, we uh, use the offshore uh, cable near Muroto. The DUNET is uh, located in here. 
And uh, it shows a clear record of the earthquake uh, over the 50 kilometer of length. And uh, then uh, we are encouraged to about by the, this uh, result and we started the dust observation with a cable near DUNET uh, to compare with a uh, uh, DUNET record. So this is the record of, of the magnitude 7.0 earthquake offshore uh, uh, Japan Trench. So the distance between the here and the uh, Japan Trench is uh, over 1,000 kilometers, but uh, uh, it preserves good uh, phases, uh, continuously over uh, 50 kilometers, uh, like shown here. So this is a very encouraging result, and we continue to uh, observe uh, the uh, with the cable to compare with the performance in uh, strong motion record. So to summarize, the uh, DUNET uh, seafloor seismometers are uh, using caisson penetrating into the seafloor and the seismometer uh, in the caisson is packed with sand and the complete burial, burial is performed. And deep borehole installation using uh, cementing, uh, we have uh, three of them. And uh, now new installation technique is developed to use to use a seafloor drill and the cementing by ROV. And the surface soft sediment led to significant amplification in the horizontal components in the strong motion record. And sedimentary basin structure also contribute amplified long period uh, seismic motion. And uh, we conducted the uh, uh, shake table experiment to find the packed sand would start to flow at high acceleration if not vibrated. And uh, distributed fiber strain can be used for strong motion. Uh, this is the talk. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Hiraki san. That was great. Um, all right, so now um, we're going to move into the, um, the core thing we want to do here, our uh, a discussion and a feedback section. And uh, so maybe first, um, I don't know if anyone has any questions or comments they wanted to offer in, in response to any of the talks or questions for um, Araki-san. Um, if you could uh, raise your hand or pop it in the um, chat, that would be perfect. I can uh, recognize you. Anyone? All right, uh, Jeff. So Araki-san, thanks so much for such an amazing talk at the progression over 10 or 20 years or whatever it was, it's just unbelievable. Um, I'm really curious about the shake table tests and how much the recording fidelity improved after the initial shaking. And, you know, in particular, are you really able to get reliable energy estimates out of the, the sort of buried instrument after, you know, not after the, the sand has had a chance to really pack in? So we repeated uh, this uh, sequence of uh, uh, strong motion and uh, quiet. And uh, the first trial made a uh, flow of uh, a sand due to probably due to some, we have some small gaps in between the sand uh, uh, grain. And uh, after the, this flow, uh, reduction of the level of the sand surface occurred. And then the never the uh, such flow occurred from the second times. So the, we believe that the uh, uh, sand packing by gravity its own is not uh, perfect. And uh, the vibrating the uh, deployed sand should improve the uh, packing quality. So this would be maybe enough. Uh. Yeah, so yeah. in the later, so after it's had a chance to improve the packing quality, can you just say a little bit more about how, how accurate the records were compared to the input? Uh, so the, actually the uh, uh, coherence of the record is very good. So uh, better than the 98% coherence. So I think uh, the, uh, 
uh, if the uh, sand grain hold the friction between the uh, surface of the uh, pressure vessel and the caisson, we can uh, accept that the quality is uh, as the motion of the uh, sediment. That's really impressive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we also have a question in the chat from um, from Helen. Uh, the character of the noise on OBS instruments deployed in shallow water on the shelf is significantly different than deep water instruments. Is there a good sense of how that may or may not impact the improvement due to burial? Uh, shallow water? So actually we have avoided to uh, situate the sensor in shallow water than uh, 1,000 meter. Uh, one, because of the necessity to bear it with the fishery activity. And the other is the noise environment, of course. So <laughs> I'm not the right person to answer that question. Uh, so, but uh, we, we actually avoided so far. <laughs> Fair enough. I think, uh, uh, are you gonna respond to that question? Well, if there's anybody with, who can answer this question, it's probably me, uh, having spent too much time in shallow water. There's absolutely no question that burying sensors in shallow water um, will greatly improve the quality of the data. Um, one still is going to see the uh, compliance signal, both on the horizontals and on the vertical. Um, as you know, Alan, you can take a lot of that out with a, with a pressure gauge. Uh, we have a paper uh, that, that is about to be submitted uh, using horizontal pressure gradient measurements to take the compliance noise out of the horizontals as well. Um, so there, I think you definitely want to bury in shallow water if you can. Uh, I think you want to um, definitely have a pressure gauge and if you can add some horizontal pressure gauges as well. Um, I'll make another comment. Uh, we spent some time trying to bury sensors using a, a, a plow sort of a plow anchor system. At the time we tried it, um, it was, um, <clears throat> the sensors are kind of too big and we were trying to use the Oceanus, which was a boat with very, very poor control on when and where it was going. And it was just too difficult. Um, but I think that's something that should be explored again, particularly for shallow water, when basically could, particularly for the strong motion sensors, one could just build them into something that looks like a plow anchor take the ship and pull and get the sensor well below the seafloor uh, without needing an ROV. Great, thanks, Barr. Um, we had a, another question in the uh, chat from uh, Tim Parker. Has Donut moved to deeper boreholes grouted in as the new standard of broadband deployment? I think, um, yeah, for, yeah, Iraqi-san has, yeah, that was a question for you. Mm, uh, yeah, <laughs> so I think uh, we would pursue to uh, use a seafloor drill. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, aim to observe a shallow slip, slow slip event in real time. So this necessitates uh, such a, uh, not a surface barrier, but uh, deep penetration, at least uh, like uh, 10 to 15 meters. So, so we, we aim that to be a standard in the future. Great. Well, uh, there's, there's one more question in the chat, but I think that now um, we're kind of at, at one hour into our session. And so it'd be great to, um, to transition into the um, breakout part of our program. So I am going to take over the, um, the screen again here, I may. All right, so yeah, thank you again so much, um, Araki san for that fabulous uh, presentation. And um, yeah, and thanks to everyone for the discussion so far. So for the, um, the core of the, our remaining time, what we'd like to do is to uh, divide into a couple of breakout groups. 
where we can have um, more focused conversation on some of the different marine seismology components that we've, uh, that we've tried to describe to you. So, um, so this will not be 40 minutes, but will be uh, 30 minutes, but 45 minutes. Uh, but we'll break out into um, uh, one group focused on earthquake seismology. And so, and there we really like to get your feedback on, um, on, on some of the topics that we've just been discussing on, you know, what are the most um, important um, scientific uh, needs or capabilities for um, seafloor instrumentation to observe um, earthquake behavior. And so that will be the uh, first breakout group. And then we'll have a, um, another breakout group that will be more focused on um, geophysical imaging. So that will be the structural seismology group. And there we'd like feedback on um, some of the different imaging components that I tried to describe to you earlier. And so we'll uh, spend um, uh, 45 minutes um, in breakout groups and then we'll come back and to a plenary discussion and we won't have time to you know summarize the outcomes of those breakout groups but instead we'll be um, we'll have 15 uh, minutes at the end which will be an opportunity for any um, remaining questions or comments that uh, that people want to offer most important things that they uh, they heard in the um, in the breakout uh, discussion and so kind of the the charge for our breakout groups are, are, are to kind of tackle, at least in some way, these uh, questions. You know, what are the highest priority marine seismic needs for the goals of SC4D, like in general? You know, what are the biggest gaps that we might hope to fill with, um, with a future SC4D program? And then, um, and then quite specifically, does the scientific functionality of um, specifications of the instrumentation um, that we've been describing in the presentation accurately capture what's needed? And so a, um, a near-term uh, opportunity, as uh, Emily described, is the submission of this full MSRI proposal. And we wanna make sure that for um, long-term OBS deployments, we have, we have that correct. But, um, but we'd also like to have that discussion more broadly for other components that we, uh, that we described to you uh, today. And then finally, um, an another component that we wanted to have a chance to discuss is, you know, how can SC4D be designed to enable equitable opportunities for research and education on marine seismology in subduction zones? Um, there, we've, this workshop has brought together so many people and marine uh, seismology, and we want to continue to grow our community and make that um, uh, make opportunities for everyone um, within that in order to achieve the, the best science that, that we can. And so hopefully we can spend a little time in both of the breakouts also um, discussing that final question as well. So that's kind of the, the charge. Um, so we'll have two breakout rooms, um, one on structural seismology and one on earthquake seismology. And um, in each of those rooms, we'll yeah, hopefully discuss the, the questions I just uh, described to you. And we'll also be sharing at the beginning of each session a, um, a Google document where that everyone can um, edit. And so we'll um, have a scribe in each of the groups to um, take notes on what's, um, what's being discussed, but um, please feel free to edit and add your thoughts directly into that, uh, the Google document that we'll share. And that those Google Docs will be kind of our, our record of the feedback and discussion um, that we're having. And as we um, go into these breakouts, I just wanna remind everyone that we wanna have a inclusive and open um, discussion. So, you know, please uh, maybe remember things like the three and me rule once you've uh, spoken, wait for, give others an opportunity to speak before, before you speak again. We wanna hear from, from everyone and, um, and have a good, respectful and um, yeah, and welcoming tone for our conversation. So that is our plan. I will stop sharing and now there should be, um, two breakout um, rooms, and you should be able to, uh, to, to join those rooms. So room one is the kind of geophysical imaging room, and room two is the uh, earthquake seismology room. And then we'll come back here in, um, uh, at a quarter of, I don't know, I'm, I can only know my own time zone, at a quarter of uh, 10 on the, in a Pacific time zone, and then uh, and we'll have some plenary discussion. Everything good? Great. Um, hi, everyone. Hopefully, uh, do we have everyone back now? Yep, it looks like everybody's out of the rooms now. Great, thanks. All right, hopefully everyone had uh, productive discussions in their uh, breakout groups. Um, as we said, we don't plan to do any like report back now from those in detail, but um, I really encourage you to um, use those Google document links to continue to add any notes um, or other ideas that you have or feedback for us that you have 
and that will be kind of the, the the record of the of the feedback that we're getting. So we wanted to just have a have a chance here at the end to come all back together um, for some discussion, and um, in particular, if if anyone has um, questions that have come from um, discussions in their breakout or other important topics that we should uh, discuss at a group, we just want to have an opportunity here at the end for for any other plenary discussion. So. Does anyone have any questions that, uh, burning questions that came from the presentations or uh, breakouts or other um, points that they want to raise about um, that haven't been discussed so far? We've got it all totally right. It's perfect. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I can, I'd like to speak up. Um, just to bring up that uh, we didn't get it, there wasn't really enough time to dig deeper. Um, but uh, at least in the MSRI, there have been discussions about adding uh, auxiliary capabilities to the long term deployment OBSs. And I, I would just like to reiterate that support that we should explore that and think about how it could both benefit um, people outside of uh, seismology, but really maybe there are opportunities that would also benefit. Uh, the seismologist by adding things, and in particular, for my bias, I'm thinking like uh, adding uh, ENM uh, capabilities. But you could, all, of course, pressure gauges have been discussed. Maybe you can do something with heat flow, or who who knows what you can imagine. But having that flexibility, if it's feasible, uh, I think would be a big uh, big bonus. Thanks, Samer. Um, and I see William Frank has his hand up. I was just going to say, it sounds like it was a different conversation in the structural seismology group than in the earthquake seismology group, where there was this discussion of if we're trying to um, make an instrument that does too much and that will inev inevitably have a, a testing and, and vetting period that just will not get us the observations that we want on the time scale that we want. So there, there was, we had, I think, the opposite discussion. And 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 uh, we have the, the the breakout notes that capture that, but that was a point of uh, uh, let's say a lengthy point of discussion in our group. Interesting. We'll say that I, I know for um, Earthscope and then for on land and for the Alaska amphibious array offshore. As soon as you plan to put out a lot of instruments for a long time, the requests come for for building on that capability, building on those platforms to make other observations. And, and for the ones that Samer mentioned, things that would be highly relevant for SC4D. So yeah, that'll be a attention for us, I guess. Other questions or comments? Uh, Joe Burns. Yeah, I, I apologize this was addressed earlier. I, I had stepped out earlier, but I'm wondering if there's any concern about losing large parts of the array if there is a really large event. I mean, the goal here is to try to image really destructive feature. And I'm wondering if there's any precedent for an array being out on top of a, a nine at some point. And, you know, did Japan lose a lot of instrumentation during the, the Tohoku event or anything like that? Because, you know, if there's millions and millions of dollars of instruments out on the array and then we lose half of it and the data is all gone, that, that's not going to be a very exciting outcome. But I mean, or maybe the instruments have been pretty robust during large events. I mean, maybe it's not not a big concern. Is there anyone who would like to feel? I, that I'm just kind of asking from ignorance. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> out on top of the shelf, they'd be like right on top of the, the major slip and stuff. Thorn. Well, the the maybe uh, answer. <laughs> the seismometers are undoubtedly going to be overdriven, but. Yeah. In, in the recent GRL, you can read about uh, recovery okay. of the broadband ground displacement time history, so effectively strong ground motion from APGs for the vertical mm -hmm. right above the, the central area of, of Tohoku. So you're probably not going to get shaken any harder than that. It's above Probably 30. not. Yeah. So at least some components were able to perform as strong motion sensors offshore. But if you have very strong motion sensors, you'll, you'll also be able to keep on scale probably for the signal. It's, it's going to be how quickly you can recover them, whether you have real-time capability or you have the ability to send out a wave glider and upload the data, how quickly you could access it. But at least the experience with Tohoku was, was that we got a lot of information from the GPSA, from the, the uh, ocean bottom uh, pressure sensors that spans right through the, the critical information about the main shot. 
Does that include instruments that were like out on the shelf itself? I, I suspect yeah. it, does. it sounds like it's right, right. directly above the yeah, directly above. Oh, that's great. Go. Great, thanks, um, Ken. Yeah, this speaks more to the kind of the operational aspects, but it's something to consider as you're putting this package together. Is that you are looking at high risk events, and that this does need to be incorporated into. Uh, not only the design and the robustness, but also in terms of you, uh, accountability for, yeah, you are going to put some things in some areas like like volcanoes or near trenches and near landslides or sea slides that, that you are going to have to replenish this. So uh, th that does have to come into consideration when you're budgeting uh, work like this is, is how to sustain it for not only a, a equipment uh, longevity, but also loss. Yeah, thank you for that. Other comments and questions? Emily? I think as William summarized, we had the, the opposite conversation of the other breakout group, which was, you know, a discussion of whether we're trying to do too much and uh, the robustness of the instrument. And it was also suggested that we were being naive in uh, not having a cable and that in fact, what we're really asking for requires a cable. And I'm curious what the group thoughts of the group are on, it is clearly a strategic decision to try to do this untethered. And is that a wise decision or a really dumb one? I have a question for that, if that's okay. Do, wh what what do we know that informs that view? Has it been tried? I, I mean, I, I agree that it sounds ambitious, but 10 years sounds really, really difficult, but is five years really out of the picture? And what do we know that informs us of that? Well, let me, let me back it up. The rationale for the untethered decision is that it provides a lot more flexibility, that you can recon a site, decide that you, you, you're globally mobile at that point, right? You're not limited to countries who can afford a cable. Um, and so that's, and since um, it seems that using the full global portfolio of subduction zones is an important thing, in order to actually address the full ability of what subduction zones could do, having an untethered capability would give us a lot of room to test out one subduction zone if it is or is not answering the question to move somewhere else. We could really work in this recon mode and dive into where is most scientifically advantageous. Um, once, once you've got a cable on the ground, you are committed. So that is at least a piece of that rationale. Shoot at it, please. There's a variety of uh, comments coming through here in the, uh, in the chat. I don't know if, um, Helen, if you wanted to, um, yeah, Helen points out that possibly for funding a, a cable that might restrict us to US subduction zones. So, um, it's more of a question than a comment. I yeah. don't know, okay. but. <laughs> I can only address that by saying no one really knows, of course, but uh, there's no doubt that the scope of a cable deployment, at least of the scale of something like in Japan, is likely to be beyond the MSRI size at NSF, which means you're talking about um, MREFC. That's the program that funded, for example, EarthScope or the OOI cable that exists in Cascadia now. Um, that requires congressional buy-in. There's a whole level of, of, uh, of, of, you know, needed sort of lobbying to make those things happen. Um, we can't read the crystal ball well enough to really know if that truly re would restrict it to U.S. waters or not. Um, but, uh, you know, you can kind of draw your own conclusions from thinking about how politics works at that kind of scale. Thanks, Harold. Uh, Doug. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, the ad advice from NSF is to be scalable and to have something that can be expanded as things go along. So at the beginning, if we say we're planning for a cable, um, 
you know, I think we're then we're saying this has to be a huge project. And if we don't get the MREFC hundred million dollars, it's not going to happen. So I think um, in that sense, one has to start with um, what sort of is feasible and that doesn't prevent us from also, you know, keeping the cable in mind and maybe using, uh, I mean, in my mind, if a cable happens, it won't just be from us. It will be from, you know, needs that are like uh, earthquake early warning, um, you know, other government agencies that also need the cable. Um, and so then we can take advantage of that. And what we're doing now won't prohibit that from happening. Uh, next, uh, William, and then I want to encourage anyone who's not in our um, working group to, uh, <laughs> to chime in with your, with your feedback and thoughts too. Hopefully we're not talking too much. Uh, William. I, I have a super naive comment. Like I told the earthquake seismology, I've never done marine seismology before, but when developing an instrument, if we, if we build off of what Doug just said and that it needs to be scalable as the NSF uh, counsels, um, then, then is, is it, is it, trivial to make an OBS, a long-term five-year OBS instrument package that can also be connected to a cable later on, or that could be, you know, not, is that something that, that that's a, a reasonable ask or is that trivial or I have no idea, but potentially something to include. And also instead of uh, teaming up with government, I'm wondering if there is a possibility of team up with uh, large uh, companies such as Google no, even oil industry, if they have such cable already deployed and that can be used for such purpose. Well, that's a good point. All right, I can, I can, oh, go uh, ahead. Okay, we're at time. In 30 seconds, um, there is a, an initiative called the Smart Cable Initiative, which uh, actually has a, a kind of a, a UN-based task force. Uh, Bruce Howe at Hawaii leads it and that is, you know, advocating for and looking at those questions of making the the, um, the, the boxes that are along telecom cables uh, capable of making seafloor measurements directly, meaning putting things like pressure sensors or perhaps seismometers or whatever on them. Um, so yes, that's another dimension of discussion. It's not an easy thing, but it's another dimension that's going on. Thank you, Harold. All right, we're nearly to the um, to the top of the hour here. Um, so I think we should um, go ahead and wrap up, but I just wanna thank all of you for taking the time to um, spend two hours on your Friday and engaging with us and giving us feedback. This has been really valuable, but please please continue to do so. So if you, I, I posted um, a link to the uh, presentation, have a look, contact any of us individually, make more notes in the Google document. We really need your continued feedback in order to do a, successful job of trying to uh, design the right thing and, and, and get funding for it, make the right arguments. So yeah, thanks again. Please continue to um, feed back to us. And uh, yeah, and, and we'll post um, the recording of our talks on the um, SC4D website as well. And um, yeah, I think that's everything. So thanks everyone so much. And, and a special thanks to um, Iraqi San for staying up very late and for sharing all of the insights from uh, Donut. That was, that was fabulous. So thank you again for staying all the way to the end even. Really appreciate that.